QuickBooks Pro Desktop 2021, Adjusting Entries and Reversing Entries Introduction. Let's get into it with Intuit's QuickBooks Pro Desktop 2021. Here we are in our Get Great Guitars homepage. We currently have the open windows open. You can open the open windows by going to the view dropdown, selecting the open windows list. We're now going to be talking about the adjusting entries. As we talk about adjusting entries, we want to basically think about two separate things in our mind in terms of the accounting process. One being the data input, by far the largest component in terms of time that will be used in it, because that's going to include the whole process here the vendors, the customers, the employees entering all the data here, and then the adjusting process, which we will do periodically, typically monthly or yearly, in order to adjust the financial statements to be closer to an accrual and or possibly tax basis when needed for the year end, uh, to be closer to the basis necessary for whatever our needs are. So we need the financial statements to display to somebody else or for decision-making purposes or possibly for tax purposes. And therefore, we need to make those adjustments periodically from time to time. So the way you want to think about it then is whether you're going to do the adjusting entries or whether you have somebody else do the adjusting entries like your tax firm or your CPA firm or something like that. You want to make the data input process, the process of entering the data as easy as possible, as easy on you, as well as you want to think about it as if if I was to hire somebody else to basically do data input, I want to set it up so that they could do the data input without really understanding the full accounting cycle. They can enter the data for the month, do the standard vendor, customer, and employee cycle. And I want to make that as easy as possible. And if, if that means I have to deviate from an, an accrual basis to some degree, then that's okay as long as I can make a nice easy adjusting entry periodically at the end of the month or the end of the year. It'll be saving time to do so. So that's going to be our goal. We're going to make the data input as easy as possible. And then we're thinking at the end of the month or the end of the year, we'll do the adjusting entries and, and clean this thing up so that it'll be proper for presentation purposes or decision making purposes. Now, when you think about should I, who should be doing the, the adjusting entries, that's an open question as well, because you can do adjusting entries into, into the books and, and adjust them, of course. But note that no matter what you do, you're going to have some adjustments that are going to need to be done at the end of the year for tax preparation in any case. And oftentimes, small you know com companies will then want to use the CPA firm or the tax firm to help them with their adjusting entry process. So you might want to, if you're a bookkeeper or if you're doing your own books, to discuss the adjusting entry process with your, your tax firm or your accountant and see what would work best there. Cause that could save time. Cause if you're doing the adjusting entries yourself and they have to do the adjusting entries basically again, in order to adjust it for tax basis purposes and bookkeeping purposes, it would be easier then to say, Hey, look, I'm going to tell you exactly how I enter the data into the system. And then I'm going to rely on you to do the adjusting entries. And you can expect the adjusting entries to look the same based on how I'm entering the data. So you might want to work with, with an outside department basically to help you to, to figure out what would be the easiest way to, to do that so that we don't have two people kind of trying to do the adjusting entries and, and you know time could be wasted doing that. So in any case, let's think about the adjusting entries by opening up the financial statements. We're going to go to the reports drop down, company and financial. We're going to go to the balance sheet standard. We're going to be changing the dates up top. I'm going to change the range from 010121 to, to uh, I'm going to make it as of 022821 and OK. So here's our balance sheet. This is where we stand at this point in time. We've entered two months of data. We're not going to be entering adjusting entries for the end of January. We will for the end of February. You might say, well, why are we doing it just for February? Because we just wanted to enter two months of data to show the difference in the data input for two months of data. And now we just want to show the adjusting entry process as of this point in time. As a general rule, you may be doing your adjusting entries basically on a monthly basis. But remember what the purpose of the adjusting entries is going to be typically. It's going to be so that you can present the financial statements uh, to, to uh, so that you can present the financial statements to basically outside people or for decision making purposes internally to, to make it more on an accrual basis for the matching principle or possibly at year end for taxes. So some companies may not do the adjusting entries then if you're a small company, you may not do the adjusting entries every month because you might just enter the data basically for the year and that'll be enough for your decision making purposes and then rely and get the help from your tax professional to help you and your CPA firm 
or your accounting firm to help you periodically to make the adjustments necessary for tax preparation uh, at the end of the year. So this is one of those areas where you got to think about, okay, what's best for me? What kind of adjusting entries do I want? And then when do, how often do I need to do them? And then how do I want to set them up so I can link them and work with whoever I'm working with, such as an accounting firm, such as a uh, CPA firm. So, but some of these adjusting entries will be standardized if you're thinking about normal accrual basis. So it's not like they're going to be completely different for every single company. You can have the same concepts that will apply. And so we'll take a look at some of those in uh, in this section. So now I'm also, I'm also going to open up the income statement or the profit loss by going to the reports drop down company and financial profit and loss P and L changing the dates up top from 010121 to 022821. So there we have our profit and loss. And then normally, oftentimes, you'll be working with a trial balance. Or if you're an accounting firm, you'll often be working with a trial balance to enter the data into the adjusting entry. So we're going to go to the reports drop down. We're going to go to the uh, company and financial. Uh, let's start. I'm going to go to the accounting and taxes and then go to the trial balance. So let's change the dates up top from 010121 uh, to 022821. So there's going to be our trial balance. So the adjusting entries are going to be something that we will enter as of the end of the time period. So they're all going to be as of what we'll call the cutoff date. So in other words, we, we're not so concerned with, every, with making everything perfect, perfect within the interim period. I'm not concerned with making things perfectly on an accrual basis as of like February 15th. I'm, making, I'm concerned at this point with making things correctly on an accrual basis as of the cutoff date, the date that we will be preparing the financial statements, that will be in this case, the end of February, February 28th. So all of our adjusting entries are gonna be as of February 28th. Also note that the adjusting entries is gonna be like the last thing you, you do uh, in the process of the accounting cycle for the month or the year. And that means that uh, we've already done the data input. We entered enter all the data. We did the bank reconciliation and now we're going to do the adjusting entries. Now, the adjusting entries are not going to be including cash. So in that way, they're a little bit more complex because uh, a lot of times we use the, the, the checking account in order to enter the data. And adjusting entries will also not have a set form for them typically. In other words, if I go to the home page, there's no set form for the adjusting entries because these are not the day-to-day -day entries. These are the adjustments we need to make at the end of the period. So there's not going to be any form for them. And they typically will not include uh, transactions for cash because cash has been reconciled. Cash is good. It's going to be some of the other accrual items that will be involved. And therefore, we can't use the cash register. So we will typically need to use journal entries in some way. Now, we could still use the register and, and we'll talk about it. We'll do it both with journal entries and we'll do it with the register unless the register, unless the journal entry gets too long and the register actually gets more difficult to use than to use uh than to use just a journal entry but typically you'll see the adjusting entries done with journal entries and even if you use the register as you've seen as we've seen in the past quickbooks will basically default to the form of a journal entry using the registers is basically a journal entry unless there's some other form related to it so there's not going to be any cash involved now normally if you think of like a a true adjusting entry has to do with timing differences so adjusting entries will typically then have a balance sheet account and an income statement account, meaning there's gonna there's typically gonna be one balance sheet account, one income statement account, because it's dealing with a with basically a time difference. When do we recognize either an income or an expense? That's gonna be the general rule. We'll have some exceptions to that rule because I, again we'll do some things that we 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 might set up as adjusting entries that are gonna be there to to work with the system logistically. So we'll adjust things. Uh, so that the data input will be as easy as possible and then we'll make any adjustments we might need at the end so we might have some adjusting entries that don't fall into the standard what you would think about as adjusting entries like a i would say a true adjusting entry will have a timing difference to it meaning a balance sheet account and an income statement account an adjusting entry that i wouldn't call like a true adjusting entry but it's still an end of period adjustment that we plan on doing and therefore will be adjusting will be one that doesn't have a balance sheet and income statement account, possibly only having like two balance sheet accounts, such as we're going to adjust the accounts receivable that had that negative receivable in, in it to a, uh, to a liability account. That's a logistical kind of thing that we did that works in the system. 
Uh, but but it's not like a true adjusting entry because we're not really posting anything to the income statement at that point. Okay, so let's oftentimes if you work with a CPA firm, what they will do, if you work with like a someone outside a CPA firm, you might ask them to do the adjusting entry process, but you may not want them to actually enter the data into your system, right? Because they will they will often say, hey, look, I need to do the adjusting entries for taxes. I need to do the adjusting entries to make the financial statements. And they might do that outside of your system and then provide you with the data so that you can put it into your system rather than them putting it directly into QuickBooks. In other words, an outside CPA firm might get your QuickBooks file, but they, they, may, they probably will not, may not actually enter the, enter the transactions into your system because they want your permission to do that, basically. They might rather export the trial balance like this into a worksheet and then do, do the adjusting entry process so they can see the effect of the adjusting entry process. And you also have a nice external worksheet outside of the system showing the adjustments that are strictly related to the adjusting process. And you could put notes, you know, on, on that worksheet and then decide to, to enter the adjustments that are necessary into the system. So to think about that, we'll, we'll actually put together a worksheet next time and we'll show you how to do this. We'll take this trial balance and we'll create a worksheet that will look like this. So you can basically see this in terms of a debit and credit format and something like what, what an accounting firm or CPA firm might use to basically do these adjusting entries. And then, they, and then we'll have a nice little worksheet that'll give us our adjusting entries in terms of debits and credits. Now you don't have to do this if you don't wanna do these adjusting entries, but just note this is kind of the, the link that you gotta think about even if you're not doing the adjusting entries when you work with like the CPA firm. What, what adjustments are they gonna make and how are you gonna get them into your system? Do you want them to just enter them into your system? And so, or, or do you want this other worksheet, which will often be used and then work with them to, to see how, how you're going to get those adjustments into your system? Because also note that some adjustments, although they're going to be necessary in order to make the financial statements correct, they're going to throw off our, th what we've been putting together that logistically works well for us. So we, we've put together a system, you'll recall. We're trying to think about how to make the bookkeeping process as easy as possible. Some of the adjusting entries that, that get put into place might adjust the timing differences so that it lines up with a more perfect accrual basis, but they're going to mess up <laughs> our data input process possibly. So we want to say, okay, how can, we, how can I work with this adjusting entry process so that I can get it right as of a point in time and not throw off what we're doing in terms of our, our normal adjusting entry process? So one way you can, you can do that is you can enter the adjusting entries and then you can reverse some of those entries, meaning you're, you're going to enter them and make things correct as of the, the date of the financial statements or tax preparation, the end of February in our case, the month end or year end. And then you're going to reverse what you did if, it, if it's going to mess up basically the normal process on the, on the data input side of things so that you can go back to the system that works best from a logistical standpoint. And then you'll just keep on flipping back and forth at, at period end at the end of each month or at the end of each year so that so that it'll, it'll be correct on a tax basis or financial basis and then you'll flip back to what is easiest for data input uh, so this is what that might look like here's some of the adjusting entries that we'll we'll go over so you got adjusting entries for accrued expenses things like accrued uh, interest for example so accrued interest is something for example if if we didn't pay if interest accrues we take out a loan for example and the interest goes up but we haven't yet paid the interest then that represents something that interest has accrued we should record it as an expense even though we haven't yet paid it so that means that we should record basically the the recruit in interest when it is incurred in the time period it is incurred even if we didn't pay the interest in that time period but when we make the payment we will probably then want to just include the interest pay the interest that we pay at the point in time we make the payment so it's possible that we might want to reverse that accrued interest so that means at the end of the period i'm going to record the accrued interest and then maybe i reverse it right after the end of the period so i'll do the adjusting entry on on february 28th and then i'll reverse it on march 1st so that it doesn't mess up the bookkeeper when they actually paid off the loan payable to have this adjusting entry in place. So we'll see that example. And then we'll break out the short-term and long-term portion of a loan. So if we have a loan that extends beyond one year, then it's gonna have both a short-term 
per portion and a long-term portion. To report it properly, we need to break out the short-term and long-term portion. But again, that doesn't make any sense when you're actually doing the data input because when I start to make a loan payment, I don't want to see two accounts. I want to see one account so I know what the loan balance is. I don't want to have to add two accounts up to get to the loan balance. And I certainly don't want to, every time I make a payment, break out between the short-term and long-term portion, which will change every time I make a payment. So that's another one that will basically reverse afterwards. Also know that this breakout that, uh, between short-term and long-term loan is not really a, a true adjusting entry in that it doesn't have a... a uh, a balance sheet account and an income statement account. It's not really a timing thing. It's just two balance sheet accounts. We're breaking out the short term and long term portion. And then we're, we'll have accounts payable or sales cutoff information, meaning we might have a situation where, where we issued the invoice in QuickBooks after the cutoff, after uh, February 28th, but did the work before the cutoff. And therefore, on an accrual, we should be on an accrual basis, even though we entered the invoice after the cutoff, the revenue should be before the cutoff. So we should enter an entry recording the revenue before the cutoff date and, rec and recognizing it then. And then we're, we're almost surely going to want to reverse that because, the, because if we don't, we'll double input the data when the actual invoice was entered. So uh, if, we, if we don't do that, then and notice when you work with, a, with an accounting firm, this, this kind of thing could happen, right? They basically enter something in. And then if it's not reversed, it's been entered in the system twice, which means you basically will recognize the revenue twice. So the reversing entries are kind of important or knowing whether or not you need to reverse something is important. Then we got like a prepaid expenses, such as prepaid insurance. So prepaid insurance is something that we will have to adjust recognizing the expense over the time when we use the, the insurance policy for that case. And that one will not be reversed. That's a permanent difference depreciation recording the cost of the depreciable assets that will be depreciated over time we'll have to record that now this one is something that that, it, that is one that the accounting firm or tax firm will have to do it year in like no matter what because the depreciation will differ for taxes than for books so small companies might just want to put their books on a tax basis depreciation and then just use the 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 the, the tax software to tell them what their depreciation adjustment will be or even if you're you know, a mid-sized company and whatnot, you might, you might, and you want to record your depreciation on a book basis, not using a tax basis, differentiating between tax and book basis, the tax software will often have, have both of those calculations because the tax software, you're going to have to enter it into the tax software anyways. So if you're trying to do your own depreciation calculation, in other words, uh, it's not your, the, the CPA firm or the tax firm is still going to have to do it again, at least for taxes. Uh, if not for, for books as well. So you might as well use their system to do it. You're, it's not really saving time to do that. So you might, you might depend, in other words, on the tax software to help you record the depreciation. And that's not going to be reversed. That'll be a permanent difference. And then we have unearned revenue and negative accounts receivable. Now the unearned revenue, there's two kind of ways you're going to see it. And this kind of bugs people. Uh, but you know, they, they might see unearned revenue that has accumulated upwards and then we have to reduce the unearned revenue and record the revenue that had been earned. That's the format that you will see most of the time in accounting courses. And you'll see that in companies that uh, like magazine companies or something that they have a subscription model. They collect the money beforehand and then they distribute the magazines for the year and they have to determine how much of the revenue has been incurred. Uh, but we also have this issue and it's very common where you're trying to use that that accounts receivable to track a deposit that was made and you end up with a negative receivable which works well logistically but again is not exactly proper for financial reporting purposes so once again we will adjust that prop that issue here and then that is one we want to reverse for sure because again that the reason we're doing there is a reason we're doing that so we'll talk about all these uh one by one and we'll we'll, we'll go through this both in terms of a, a normal process that you would see with a with a public accounting firm, which is like entering the journal entries into like a worksheet like this. And then we'll talk about how you could enter it into the, the accounting system if you were to enter it directly into QuickBooks using the registers if possible. And then we'll talk about at the end of this, you know, how you can basically work with, with an accounting firm that might be using a worksheet like this and think about how to enter that data into your system periodically, possibly yearly or monthly.